Thank you so much to all of you for staying uh, and listening to Professor Lange's presentation. Professor Manfred Lange uh, was the founding director of the Energy, Environment and Water Research Center at the Cyprus Institute in Nicosia. Today, his professor at the Cyprus Institute is also the director of the Future Earth MENA Regional Center, and he serves on the steering committee of the Mediterranean Experts on Environmental and Climate Change Initiative, the MEDEC. His research includes the assessment of climate change impact on, with a focus on water and energy security, renewable energy sources, as well as water use efficiently, in the built environment. I think it's particularly important to uh, listen to his point of view and to his research because, because we've known for a long time that the Mediterranean is overfished, overcrowded and overheated, but this year has been particularly brutal. And this year, this, year, this summer actually, I've, I've learned two new terms, at least they were new for me, uh, that describe, I think, quite well the state, the current state of the Mediterranean. So the first expression is the marine heat wave, which is an extreme rise in ocean temperature that lasts for extended periods of time. And due to global warming, both the magnitude and the frequency of these marine heat waves have been increasing in recent years. And then the other term I learned is the Medicane, and Medicane is the contraction of Mediterranean and hurricane. And it describes a rare but destructive weather phenomenon that scientists believe will intensify in a warming world. And one of the recent manifestations of the Medicaid was the were the flash floods that uh, made thousands of people, that killed thousands of people in Libya recently. So I'm going to leave the floor at least virtually to Professor Lange. And I also want to reassure you that uh, his take on climate change in the Mediterranean is a bit more uplifting than mine, because he will also present you some solutions and ideas. Good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by thanking the organizers to inviting me to speak to you, even though only remotely. To get into the subject, let's look at some threats facing the Mediterranean region today. Right from the start, we have to state that the terrestrial and marine regions of the present Mediterranean basin are significantly affected by anthropogenic, that's to say man-made, environmental and climate changes. Ongoing and anticipated demographic development implies growing need for resources, and that constitutes an important socio-economic factor for increasing environmental changes. Let me give you some details. The population growth in the Mediterranean between 1950 and 2010 amounted to approximately 275 million to about 500 million people today. The eastern and southern coastal regions account for 75% of that growth. A growing life expectancy further increases population numbers. And last but not least, an enhanced urbanization and changed or more demanding lifestyles also imply an increase in resources needed. Let me offer a warning though. It has to be said that anthropogenic influences are important, but they are by no means the only cause of environmental change. Let me give you uh, some introduction to MEDEC, uh, which addresses the Mediterranean through a network of scientists that was founded in 2015. MEDEC stands for Mediterranean Experts on Climate and Environmental Change. The network comprises about 600 independent scientists from 35 nations. What does MEDEC do? Well, we analyze and summarize the results of studies on climate and environmental changes in the Mediterranean region. The resulting risk assessments are made available to decision makers and the interested public. Take a look at the website and you'll find all that. 
Now, if you don't want to read through the full report of some 600 pages, you can look at the summary for policymakers, which is much more handleable. What is the present climate about? Climate change, it has to be stated, is one of the most important components of Mediterranean environmental changes. Let's look at the current situation and the past situation. In blue, you see Mediterranean mean annual temperatures. The twiggling curve is the mean annual temperature distribution and the blue smooth line is a running mean. The same goes for the green curves, which gives the global mean temperatures. If you look at the curves, you can see that they are more or less uh, in line until about 1990. And then they start to diverge. And what you can see is that the Mediterranean mean annual temperatures are presently at least half a degree higher than the global means. This is why the Mediterranean has been called a global change hotspot. Now, in addition, we have a number of environmental disturbances uh, that add stress to the Mediterranean environment. In particular, let's look at atmospheric, marine and land pollution, which are threats to environmental integrity. I have only two examples uh, from the marine sector. One is the use of fertilizers uh, in the countries and the introduction of nitrogen uh, from point sources into coastal waters. Uh, this constitutes significant stress for coastal ecosystems. The second example deals with plastic waste. And here you can see that within the Mediterranean, the highly urbanized areas and the coastal regions are most strongly affected by the increase of plastic waste, which constitute a significant environmental stress on marine ecosystems. Other factors include the accelerated change in the use of land and sea, particularly uh, an increase in urbanization already mentioned and a rural exodus. This implies a loss of biodiversity and open habitats. The degradation of forests to overexploitation uh, has uh, devastating effects on forest ecosystems uh, which need to be stopped. The overexploitation of marine resources and an unsustainable fishing practices are another important factor, leading actually to the cumulative percentage of collapsed and overfished stocks across the Mediterranean amounted to more than 60%. Another issue is the spread of non-native or so-called invasive species. The Levantine Basin, or the eastern part of the Mediterranean, is a hotspot for the settlement of many non-native invasive species which come primarily from the Red Sea via the Suez Canal. On land, we see non-native species primarily in human-modified ecosystems and in regions with high infrastructure development. Now, what we all would like to know is what lies in store for us in future. Now, in science, we do modeling to assess possible future changes in climate. To do that, we need input parameters. And one important input are pathways of greenhouse gas emissions. This is a representation of four different so-called emission paths, uh, which have been assembled by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, in short. Let's look at the green curve first, which is a sort of optimistic uh, emission pathway, uh, which actually shows some decreasing atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide equivalents. On the other hand, RCP 8.5 shows a strong increase or 
by about three factor of three until the end of the century. Now what do models do with this? Now the blue curve shows the mean annual temperatures that are projected uh, for RCP 2.6, that's to say the optimistic uh, emission pathway. And what you can see is that we end with mean annual temperature increases of about 1.5 degrees or even less, which would adhere to the Paris Agreement of some years ago. However, looking at RCP 8.5, you see a strong increase in temperatures, ending up with mean global temperature rises relative to 1980 to 1999 of almost 5 degrees Celsius. If you look at the spatial distribution of these increases, you can see that uh, for the optimistic uh, RCP 2.6 scenario, the increases are moderate, as already seen in the mean global temperatures. Uh, the uh, RCP 8.5, though, leads to temperature increases of up to 6 to 7 degrees, which is enormous. Now you may say, well, this RCP 8.5 is probably unrealistic and overly pessimistic. However, last year, the global atmospheric CO2 equivalent was measured at 508 ppm. And you can see that lies far above the emission pathway of RCP 8.5. So the bad news is, is that RCP 8.5 is not only the more realistic pathway, it probably underestimates the emission of greenhouse gases in the future and therefore the expected warming. Now, what are the impacts of such changes? Let's look at food security first. Climate change increases the risk of food security in the Mediterranean basin. That has to be stated clear and without doubt. Uh, this includes a number of factors. Warmer and drier climate means less water and reduced productivity. More frequent and more intense extreme events as part of the climate change scenario leads to destroyed crops, loss of soil and arable land. An increase in soil salinization and soil degradation means decreasing fertility of cultured crops. The ocean acidification, which we come to a little later, uh, leads to declining fish stocks. Sea level rise will uh, reduce arable land and the Nile Delta in Egypt is a particular point in case. And the emergence of new pathogens um, create threats to human health, but also leads to declining biodiversity. Food security, therefore, is clearly threatened. Another look at impacts concerns ecosystems in general. Marine ecosystems are affected. The highest proportion of threatened marine habitats in Europe are found in the Mediterranean. Approximately 32% of habitants are threatened and 15 habitants are acutely threatened. The Mediterranean is characterized by a large number of endemic species, that's to say species that are found only in the Mediterranean. This is a unique asset. However, it also increases the risk from climate change and environmental changes. Coastal ecosystems are particularly at risk in the Middle East and North Africa or MENA region. Non-native fish species, we talked about invasive species, are a problem for coastal food chains. And the severe impairment of coastal areas due to intensive urbanization causes additional stress. In terms of terrestrial ecosystems, a decline in terrestrial biodiversity in the Mediterranean basin is seen to be greater than in most other regions of the world and it's expected that further decline will happen 
due to environmental changes. Climate changes imply an increased risk of forest fires. We are seeing this every year uh, and a decline in forest productivity. Furthermore, it's an impairment of freshwater ecosystems. Therefore, it can stated that ecosystems are in danger. In terms of marine ecosystems, the impacts are manifold. This uh, somewhat complicated uh, graph shows the threats to marine pelagic and benthic ecosystems in the Mediterranean. And they just mentioned too, uh, the increase in CO2 content and the warming uh, leads to a warmer, uh, more acidic ocean and the runoff of pollutants uh, leads to nutrient input and pollution in coastal waters. There are other things that I don't have time to go into, um, but there are remedies that can be applied. And one of these remedies are the introduction of marine ecosystem, uh, marine protected areas uh, in the Mediterranean. They are a cornerstone of marine conservation. However, in the Mediterranean Sea, fully protected MPAs cover only 0.04% of its surface. This compares to a global fraction of 3.6%. This notwithstanding, MPAs offer significant benefits aside from protection itself. And this will have to be taken into account. Fishery target species are recovering in these MPAs. Urchin populations are declining. However, a full protection is recommended, but this only works if the ineffective enforcement is uh, introduced. In summary, even small, well-enforced, fully protected areas can have significant ecological effects. Now, let's look at the energy sector, uh, which is actually crucial for mitigation and adaptation to and uh, from climate change. There are close links with water and food sectors, which are captured in the water energy food nexus. In terms of mitigation, that's to say the avoidance of emissions, the use of alternative or renewable energies uh, has a high potential in the Mediterranean. Higher energy efficiency and lower energy intensities would have to be introduced. And the reduced energy consumption in the transport and building sectors are an effective mitigative measure. In terms of adaptation, uh, one point in case is the use of renewables for seawater desalination uh, and electricity generation, which are increasingly important for the Mediterranean region. An increased e-mobility using renewable energies is another uh, effective adaptation strategy. In terms of built environments, low energy houses are needed with an increased and improved insulation, natural ventilation and shading. In terms of larger structures, uh, urban structures, uh, the introduction of so-called cool asphalt, uh, that's to say less heat absorbent uh, asphalt, and an intelligent road and traffic management are uh, needed to adapt to climate change. However, there are new approaches uh, in the energy sector that's, uh, we, that we should briefly look at. In terms of uh, renewables, uh, we know that solar and wind are not always available. This is called intermittency. Uh, and this needs a use of different renewable energies in a hybrid system to avoid uh, large parts of the intermittency problem. Um, this graph illustrates uh, the approach um, and uh, with regard to the hybrid renewable system, we can look at uh, sort of agriculture related uh, issues like 
bioenergy production or agri-photovoltaics. More conventional renewable uh, energy systems uh, comprise uh, photovoltaics, wind energy, geothermal energy, and so-called concentrating solar power. The electricity generated is stored either in hydrogen and batteries or in so-called pump storage, uh, and the thermal energy is stored in molten salt storage. Um, this energy can either be used as process electricity or be fed back to the grid uh, and thereby uh, we can see that in addition to the advantages of avoiding intermittency we also introduce elements of a circular economy. Agricultural waste is needed to uh, run biogas plants. They provide energy, heat, methane, hydrogen and diastate. And diastate uh, is an important component of organic fertilizers that can be fed back to agriculture. Now, within the Cypress Institute, we have looked at a particular innovative approach of co-producing electricity and desalinated seawater. We use concentrated solar energy in combination with other renewable energies and thermal storage to do so. The approach is quite simple. Uh, we have solar energy that is harvested uh, in collector fields or through other means that feed a thermal energy storage uh, or batteries. The energy stored is used to uh, uh, produce steam that can be run, uh, that can run steam turbines to produce electricity, and the energy still contained in the steam and heat from the storage can use the multi-effect distillation units to produce drinking water. One problem of desalination is the uh, expulsion of brine or high saline water into coastal waters, which leads to damages of coastal ecosystems. And here we also um, want to avoid damages to these marine ecosystems by again introducing circular economy elements. The already mentioned agricultural waste uh, uh, will help to produce energy in biogas plants, which drives seawater desalination. Now, the extraction of minerals from the brine provides inorganic fertilizers, which can be fed back to agriculture. So that's an additional benefit of this. We use concentrating solar power, that this helistat field. We use solar stirling motors. These are the solar dishes shown there. We use photovoltaics and we use wind energy. We use multi-storage uh, energy uh, facilities, both batteries and thermal salt storage. And this enables the polygeneration of portable water from desalination, electricity, and heating and cooling for industry and space cooling, uh, respectively. So let me come to a summary and conclusion of what I tried to say climate and environmental changes that are largely anthropogenically influenced or caused, that's to say by us, are significantly responsible for the current and future state of the Mediterranean region. The reports of the Mediterranean experts on climate and environmental change provide realistic risk assessments. The expected climate change will have significant consequences for water, energy, and food security. Current and expected environmental changes threaten the biodiversity and integrity of Mediterranean freshwater and terrestrial ecosystems. In addition, the marine and coastal ecosystems are at risk. However, marine protected areas can offer relief 
and need to be urgently introduced or expanded in the Mediterranean Sea. The energy sector offers innovative solutions to uh, effective mitigation and adaptation, but this all needs interdisciplinary and cross-sector investigations and measures uh, which are required to enable effective policy strategies and measures. With that, I would like to end by thanking you for your kind attention.